You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Andreas Steno. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. I'm Andreas Steno, founder and CEO of Steno Research, and this is your weekly independent macro podcast with actionable ideas. And uh, as a broad disclaimer, we ought to remind you that our trade ideas might be... Sometimes maybe good, sometimes maybe <laughs> shit. <laughs> this is the best disclaimer in the world. Gennaro Gattuso, uh, at the time manager of... I think I think Sion in uh, in Switzerland, Switzerland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a, a legendary press conference this one. Yeah. Go watch it if you haven't. Formidable. Yeah. yeah. Emil Müller, my uh, lieutenant, welcome to the show. Cheers. Thank you. Head of research here at uh, Steno Research. Yeah. And um, in 15 minutes time, we're joined by one of our friends, Dario Perkins yeah. of TS Lombard, for a discussion on central banks. Um. <laughs> we basically faced kind of a shitstorm after we released an article called uh. Your Local Central Bank is Insolvent. And while that may, might be technically true, it obviously isn't practically true. Oh. Uh, and we also wrote that explicitly, but of course, it was kind of a tabloid oh. uh, headline, yeah, yeah, clickbaity yeah. headline. And sometimes you need a clickbaity headline sure. to get people to yeah. uh, actually read relevant stuff. Yeah. Uh, the article was very relevant, and we'll get back to it in a second also in the discussion with Dario, because it is very true that central banks face some of these political constraints due to this negative equity um, that they're now faced with. Mm. But before we get to that, Emil, yep. um, let's remind our audience that uh, this is just uh, a, a small appetizer uh, of all of the content that we create at Steno Research. Uh, if you're interested in more, go to stenoresearch.com. We have a 14-day free trial, so you can try it without even paying. Um, and um, yeah, you have access to our Data Hub Live portfolio, 25, 30 research pieces a week. And now also a research coverage of digital assets. So towards the yeah. end of the show, we'll invite our new head of cryptocurrency uh, research, Mass Eberhardt, to the Macro Sunday podcast as well. So you get just a very brief flavor of um, our newly launched coverage on digital assets. Something of relevance, I think. Um, of course, it's a topic that divides. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, oh, it, it's so binary. Either people, they, they don't even want to hear of anything else but it, or they yeah. really despise it with, with, with a passion. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it is uh, basically the only theme on earth that is more dividing, the, dividing than the Israel-Palestine. Yeah, conflict. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that and crypto. Yeah. <laughs> Get um, blood boiling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> but before we uh, get to the discussion with Dario, I'd like to set the scene um, after another week of um, discussions mm -hmm. On the issuance pace in the U.S. Treasury market, um, it was very clear early last week that after the, say, 40, 50 basis points move in the 10-year point of the yield curve, suddenly a lot of corporates uh, had issuance needs. <laughs> uh, that's typically <laughs> what happens, right? Uh, yeah. They probably had some needs and they postponed and postponed and postponed yeah, and yeah. waited for a better swap curve to, yeah. to actually um, pull the trigger. So... From an issuance perspective, Emil, you've been looking into the issuance for 2024 relative yep. to the projections from the Treasury and the Congressional Budget Office and, mm. and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> on a top-down level, <laughs> is it even f feasible uh, that those projections are true? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, listen, it, it's a very ungrateful task to be, to be, uh, to be handed over. I mean, to... to, um, to uh, to do projections on the entire American economy whilst uh, <laughs> looking at the needs of the public coffers with uh, the Bidenomics in the front seat, that's a tough ask. So it's not, it's not so much that I really, really want to, want to hammer them really. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but when, when I look at the fund fundamentals of it, I think it's, it's quite clear that most of the political risks, which obviously aren't reflected in those, uh, those forecasts are tilted towards higher, uh, uh, budget deficits, which eventually will mean uh, will mean uh, more more debt issues, unless we see some fiscal consolidation, which to me seems completely out of this world at this point. Unless, of course, it gets enforced by 
by the tra- trajectory of uh, the Congress not being able to uh, to reach any sort of agreement on uh, the pending shutdown and uh, and the, the fiscal correction uh, kicking in by yeah. 1st of January. So, so I, I mean, obviously, when you forecast a budget deficit and the subsequent issuance need, yeah. it's a politically hot potato to try and... Sure. You, you don't really try to take an opinion as a forecaster here, no. if you're working for the budget office, that is. Yeah. Uh, because obviously, if you um, project a much larger deficit for next year, it could be... Um, basically assessed as uh, a high probability of a hard landing scenario. You don't yeah. want to send that signal. No. Uh, so obviously there are loads of political uh, considerations here when you do such a forecast. Yeah. And given that <laughs> the very precedent uh, <laughs> behind the steering wheel is not really able uh, <laughs> uh, to figure out whether we're talking about millions, billions, <laughs> or trillions. No, um, no. It, it doesn't make the task any easier. So here is our first soundbite of the week right. with Joe Biden mixing <laughs> billions, trillions, and millions in the same sentence. For example, there is a situation where there's an estimation of somewhere between 700 billion and a trillion 300 million billion dollars. <laughs> so if we look at the actual numbers here, we, yeah. um, let, let's hope that we're a bit better at <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. getting millions and billions and trillions right here. Um, we're looking into an issuance for next year, yeah. say in the range of two trillion plus on a net basis. Yeah. So that's at least the official projection right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess since 1st of October, we've had almost net net a trillion added to the uh, <laughs> deficit outstanding or mm. the uh, debt outstanding from the US. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of trillion, does that sound feasible to you? Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I think one thing you should take into account here is not necessarily, I mean, you know, we can we can spit out nominal numbers here and and uh, whatever, but you know the hard fact of the matter is that the both the CBO and the OBO has been consistently uh, um, correcting the assessment for the coming year, and they have consistently gotten this year completely wrong. Yes. So um, on that note, without any real uh, you know political mechanisms to sort of uh, to uh, restrain the Biden administration, I'm extremely, uh, extremely skeptic towards their initial projections, which we saw here, start of the month. So no, I think, I think, um, I mean, yeah, and also, I mean, if you look at the geopolitical landscape, if if something happens in Middle East, if I don't know, you know, something happens in China, whatever. Um, you need some more naval presence or whatever mm. that, you know, and, and, and doing defense spending cuts is difficult and, you know, politically. And then uh, add to that, we are in, in an election year. Typically mm. don't see fiscal consolidations in, in election years. So, no, I think everything, everything that I can basically name is, is just tilting towards uh, higher budget deficits and higher issuance and essentially so, higher structural rates. Emil, I have a chart in front of me. Yeah. Um, with the quarterly revisions, basically, to the full year of 2024 deficit forecasts or net issuance forecasts, uh, yeah. ultimately, from both the Congressional, Bo- Congressional Budget Office uh, and the OMB. So two separate projections on the same number, essentially. Yeah. And the deficit projection for 24 has essentially doubled in a year. <laughs> Close um, to, yeah. 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 Uh, so it's, it's just very telling. Um, because obviously 12 months ago, mm. they projected a, a, a lot smaller deficits. Yeah. Um, in between, we've had the uh, Inflation Reduction Act going bananas. Yeah. Um, we've had war aid both to Israel and Ukraine coming online on a continuous mm-hmm. basis yeah. um, and all of that. Yeah. So Just on the my books. point here is the trajectory is relatively clear in terms of forecast errors. Yeah. It's one-way traffic towards a larger budget deficit. Yeah, 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 and um, yeah, yeah, exactly, uh, spot on. I think what, what we should be aware of is uh, the pending uh, um, debt. Um, uh, uh, what's it called? By December twenty twenty one, there will be twenty twenty five. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, there, there will be a debt ceiling once yeah. again, right? Yes, and you have an election year. 
Um, that's basically the recipe for, of, <laughs> of a large amount of issuance coming in, right? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, Biden has a lot to catch up. So um, the only thing I think could really tilt the, the sentiment towards lower rates is essentially a, that, you know, the, the drivers of the economic cooling will mm. essentially pull the risk off and uh, get the world to rally in rates. And I think that will happen. But if we look beyond that scope of next year, I think that um, the fiscal uh, situation in the US will essentially mean higher structural rates yes. from an equilibrium perspective. But um, short term, I think that's that's basically my, my base case here. Yeah, and we we need the Federal Reserve to play ball <laughs> yeah. um, to, to really buy into lower rates here. Mm, yeah. And I think I've been pretty spot on on the feedback loop uh, seen in financial markets yeah. from the latest meeting uh, at the Federal Reserve. What happened um, was essentially a rally across assets when Jay Powell acknowledged that financial conditions had tightened in market terms. Yeah. And what that means is that as soon as you see the rally, by the same logic, the Fed will have to tighten again. Yeah. Uh, and we've had hawks on parade this week. Um, yeah, every, every single member with a hawkish tilt um, basically caught the opportunity to say, well, we could done. hike in December, we're not done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, mm. yeah, I think my personal base case is still the hike in December just because markets will allow them to, mm. uh, and they need to regain control of the narrative a bit. Uh, that and, certainly isn't priced in, though. Right? Nope. That's interesting. And, and the point here is we've been all over the curve steepness since early summer. We've yeah. made a truckload of, of dollars on it. Yeah. We took profit two weeks ago. Yeah. Very, very well timed. Uh, because mm. if I'm right that this feedback loop is intact until December, mm. it screams a flatter yield curve yeah. uh, because of the front end of the curve reacting to that feedback loop uh, when long-term bond yields drop. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen that in yeah. recent days. But I think it's very binary at this juncture, right? So... Um, if that doesn't occur, if we get some more data disappointments leading up to the next meeting and we don't get that hike, mm. I think we would just have a, I mean, the, the risk off will just reemerge, right? Mm. And that would essentially just, you know, uh, refuel those exact dynamics that you just uh, mm. just explained mechanically, right? Yeah. Um, but my, my, my feeling is, I'm, I'm, and I have been talking about this for months, I, I think essentially demand side is caving in. Mm. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a, perhaps a bit less convinced that that feedback loop would be so detrimental, but there's definitely the risk scenario right there, right? Yeah. And remember that the Fed is insolvent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I should probably use another word. Uh, but to set the scene for the interview with Dario Perkins of um, T.S. Lombard, um, a few numbers on this <laughs> insolvency case of the Federal Reserve, because yeah. obviously this is, I'd say, merely a theoretical uh, insolvency. Mm. The Federal Reserve basically deals with negative equity right now. Yep. Um, and how how is that possible? Well, you have both a cash flow part of this equation and then an unrealized loss part of this equation. The cash flow part of the equation um, is derived from the Federal Reserve now paying a pretty decent interest on reserve balances of depository institutions plus reserve balances on the overnight reverse repo facility. They're paying plus 5% on both. Uh, and <laughs> on the receiving end, um, they don't have plus 5% coupons uh, to to ride from, from the holdings of assets in the QE program uh, and, um, and lending programs on average. Mm. So essentially, they have a net negative interest rate margin. Um, mm. A private bank would obviously go bankrupt quickly if, if uh, <laughs> they dealt with the same yeah. issue. Um, so... Uh, the point here is that the Federal Reserve actually pays the deposit rate uh, equivalent to the Fed funds roughly, um, which is um, frankly not the case for private banks. <laughs> to say if only. Least. Yeah, because obviously they yeah. wouldn't be able to cope with that no. either. Um, so from a cash flow perspective, they are running a deficit of ballpark a little less than $100 billion now a year. Um, so obviously the remittances from the Federal Reserve to the U.S. Treasury um, – they're now negative, um, and uh, they're not paying the money to the treasury um, because they can't. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead, uh, it is uh, basically from an accounting perspective seen as a deferred tax asset. Uh, yeah. So 
technically speaking, the treasury owes money to uh, the Federal Reserve, but they're not going to pay it. Yeah. Um, so they can just build up on that account. Yeah, I would lovely. It would yeah. be lovely to have such a relationship <laughs> to a bank, wouldn't it? I mean. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, and the, the funny thing here is, if we include the mm. hypothetical mark-to-market losses of the entire bond portfolio, oh, Jesus. We're, we're talking about an accumulated loss of close to three trillion. Yeah. Uh, is that, that, could that, pay, is- that could pay next year's uh, issuance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah but, uh, <laughs> is that an issue? Well, again, theoretically, not really. Uh, because, I mean, yeah. who, who's going to make the claim on the Fed here? No one, right? Oh. Um, but it could turn into a practical issue. Yes. And no one is better at assessing that um, sort of crossfire of dynamics between fiscal and monetary policy than namely... Dario Perkins. Um, so we'll invite Dario Perkins to the uh, Macro Sunday podcast. And as per usual, we'll have a bit of intro music. And um, since Dario is, I think, half Italian? Something like that. Quarter yeah. or something. Yeah. Like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a bit of Italian music to introduce him. Ah, oh, lovely. Him to introduce a true guest of the show to the Macro Sunday podcast again. Dario Perkins, MD of Global Macro at CS Lompard. It's great to see you here at Macro Sunday again. Good to be on. I, I think you mean friend of the show. I'm, I'm a friend of the show here. <laughs> what did I say? You stand corrected. Yes. <laughs> but I'm a true guest. Yeah. I'm a true friend. Yeah. <laughs> I defend you on Twitter when you're saying crazy stuff. I mean, that's how we got into this situation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Something that would only get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but... I um I think a week ago or two when I texted you um on whether you wanted to discuss the topic of central bank insolvency we can discuss whether that's a fair word or not the first response you gave to me was that <laughs> do you think anyone wants to listen to that discussion <laughs> but let's give it a shot Dario because I find that topic to be extremely interesting not least given the context of fiscal policy being stretched, for example, in the U.S. already. So this topic of central bank insolvency, and please feel free to correct me when I use that word, we have um, central banks with at least on paper negative equity across many of the G10 countries now due to uh, QE um, during the zero interest rate policy era now being sort of reversed uh, and central banks now have to pay much higher interest rates to uh, the depository institutions compared to the uh, running inflow of coupons from the bonds that they bought during this zero uh, policy rate regime. So Dario, first of all, is insolvency a fair word and is insolvency even an issue for central banks here? I think you know that the way to get people to get interested in this topic is to make it quite clickbaity, <laughs> saying <laughs> central banks are insolvent, which is what dragged me into this whole discussion. You know, and I ended up having all these rows with people on Twitter, all because of you and your your claim. I mean, I, I think you know, I think I know that you know that they can't go insolvent in the sense that they can't run out of money. I mean, they literally create the stuff. So we're not going to see um, you know central bankers coming out of their office with all their stuff in cardboard boxes as they've just gone bankrupt <laughs> and been kicked out of the institution. Um, but they can lose money, and they're beginning to lose money, and um, they can lose money in two ways. So the first one is that they obviously have operating costs. You know, they pay their staff wages, um, they pay interest, um, most obviously on bank reserves. Um, they receive interest. So there's a sort of net interest margin, and if that goes negative, which it is now because you know the interest rate on bonds hasn't been going up, that's their assets. The interest rate that they're paying on bank reserves has been going up. So they start to lose money. They make operating losses. Um, They can also make sort of unrealized losses on their balance sheet because they have big assets, big liabilities. The value of their assets can go down. That can create a sort of black hole, if you want to call it that. I think Mervyn King once called it a black hole. So I'm I'm not being too clickbaity if I call it that. (laughs) That can cause a hole. Um, They don't have to mark to market. So it's not as if it's, it's realized. But central banks can lose money, um, and that's that's what we're seeing. And you know, it's been for years. Um, QE was an extremely profitable exercise, and they sent that money back to the treasury, and the treasury appreciated that money, obviously. Mm-hmm. And now it's ended, and now they're, they're you know they're making various forms of loss. Um, does that matter in any true sense? Well, you know, as I said, they can't go bankrupt. Um, they don't have to meet capital requirements. 
Um, so it's not as if they're failing on some Basel free criteria. <laughs> um, the only way in which it could theoretically make money, uh, the only way it could re- really theoretically matter is if it starts to compromise their monetary policy objectives. Mm. So in theory, you could end up with losses that are so ginormous that you're pumping so much money into the economy that you can't hit your 2% inflation target anymore. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. So there's a big IMF study um, from 2019, I think, which basically uh, was a sort of meta study looking at inflation and central bank balance sheet health and just didn't find any relationship. So it it doesn't happen most of the time. Uh, The occasions when it does happen, it's usually because you're doing something really silly with your uh, exchange rate. So and usually that's because your exchange rate isn't actually compatible with your other objectives anyway. So you think about the Bank of England in 1992, when it was targeting an exchange rate and raising interest rates to 15%, even though they're in this sort of deep recession and housing market crash. Um, that was the market telling you that your policies weren't compatible anyway. So if you lose money doing that, then you're just pretty silly. Um, so the theory is it doesn't, it, you know, most of the time it's not going to matter. Um, does it matter in practice? Well, this is what I tried to you know, get to on Twitter. Um, there's really two ways. So the first one is there is a fiscal consequence of this. And, you know, Andrew Bailey alluded to this during the pandemic and nobody really understood what he was saying. But what he says, what he said was, you know, we can't cancel the debt. We can't monetize the debt, but we can change um, the time over which the debt is repaid. So we can influence the repayment. And that's basically what's happened because, you know, for all that nonsense and bullshit that people were talking about during the pandemic about central banks monetizing debt, it turns out that nothing was monetized. You know, all we did was we hid the debt on the government's balance sheet. And QE turns out to have been really, really stupid because, you know, with interest rates at 800 year lows, we converted long term debt into very short term overnight liabilities of the central bank, which looking back was a pretty dumb thing to do. And it's, it's sort of ironic now that everyone is having a go at, at Yellen for issuing all these bills, but they're issuing bills when interest rates are at a cyclical high. You know, they're, they're not doing QE when interest <laughs> rates are at sort of multi-generational lows. And so, you know, that, there is a fiscal consequence of that. And we know that um, the public finances everywhere are not in particularly good health and they're deteriorating. So once you start to lose those big remittances from central banks, that's a big deal. And typically, you know, those remittances were worth about half a percent of GDP a year. So that's something, you know, if you've got a big deficit, losing half a percent of GDP in revenues is a big deal. Uh, And so there is a fiscal impact. But the bit that will really bother central bankers is that they believe that having uh, a net positive equity position or running operational profits is a sort of protective barrier around your independence. And once you start to lose that, you begin to see your independence diluted, basically because you have to go to government's cap in hand and say, in some cases, you have to go and ask the government to be recapitalized. And then they start to look at your policies and they say, well, you know, what have you been doing that's generated these losses? (laughs) And this, you know, this sounds theoretical, but I've seen this in first hand because I was at the UK Treasury in 2010. The Bank of England was about to launch a new round of QE. And it, you know, this will raise questions about independence already, but my job was sort of head of monetary policy at the UK Treasury at the time. And one of the things I had to do was I had to write a briefing note for government ministers saying, you know, the, the Bank of England is going to ask for this QE extension. Um, you're going to have to put an indemnity on that. Uh, here are the advantages and disadvantages of doing QE. So there you've got a sort of government assessment of whether what the Bank of England is doing is a sensible thing. Now, in the end, you know, this is a sort of box ticking exercise because you can only come up with one one conclusion. And my conclusion was, you know, if you don't write the indemnity for this, then you're basically taking away their independence. So you have to. But these are the costs and these are the costs and benefits of doing it. And so you can already see that you're sort of creating a political discussion around what the Bank of England is doing. And at the Treasury at the time, there was a lot of scepticism about QE, not for the right reasons, that it was a sort of ineffective, useless tool that central banks believed in and didn't do anything for the real world. That would have been the sort of proper (laughs) disadvantage of QE. It was this worry about, you know, printing loads of money and creating inflation. 
And so, um, you know, you're sort of pulling the central bank into a sort of public policy discussion. And politicians will always think that they can spend public money, money better than a technocrat at a central bank. So you could end up in a situation where you've got sort of unscrupulous politicians who will look at this and say, well, actually, I don't want you to do that QE that you were doing and again. I want you to do a different QE because that was QE for bankers and I want you to do QE for the people. Mm. <laughs> so you can see that for if you're a central banker and you and you you sort of got this cherished independence, you know, they 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 were so happy to get their independence. They're so protective of it. Once you get yourself into this sort of position, you know, not only is it sort of embarrassing, but you start to do, you, you start to potentially dilute your independence, and that's the thing that bothers them more than anything. So on Twitter, I said this was a bit like, you know, your Twitter following going to zero. You know, you you will say <laughs> it doesn't matter, and in a sort of real sense, it doesn't matter. But one, it's embarrassing, and two, if you were getting even the slightest revenue from your Twitter feed, which I don't, but if you were getting even the slightest slightest <laughs> revenue, you might have your boss coming to you and saying, well, hang on you know, what have you been doing wrong? So you start to get some difficult questions from your boss. And that's the situation that these central banks are in. There you another uh, angle in this discussion um, that has been brought up by quite a few contrarian pundits out there is whether this net negative interest rate margin from central banks is inflationary in its nature. Now that they pay more on reserves than they receive, for example, from coupons, leading to this operating loss, is that then an inflationary impulse risking uh, sort of a feedback loop in the economy now that we uh, see this um, running feedback loop ongoing? So what's your take on that? Is it a true inflationary risk that central banks run an operating loss? Um, I I don't really see the, the mechanism. Um, are we saying that, you know, banks earn more money and so issue more credit? I mean, to me, that's not really how bank lending works. So I've never really seen that relationship between bank reserves and their lending decisions. I think that banks look at the economy, they look at the sort of, you know, they make a sort of credit decision on the individual and they decide whether a loan is going to be profitable or not. So I don't think channeling more money into them um, is going to be sort of inflationary. Um, you know, as I said, sort of, if you look at the evidence, there's no evidence that, you know, there's this big meta study, it looked at this issue, there was really no relationship between the health of the central bank and the, the inflation level that they ended up with. So I don't really buy into that. Um, it, you know, for the government, you get a sort of fiscal hit, uh, and then the government will need to find a way to sort of fill that gap. Um, but, I, you know, I don't think that's net inflationary. No, we've seen discussions on um, press conferences, both in Frankfurt with the ECB, but also uh, in Washington uh, with the Federal Reserve journalists asking central banks uh, on how to deal with these operating losses. In Sweden, the governor um, of the Riksbank even went public asking the uh, government for a recapitalization plan. We've had similar discussions ongoing in Australia. So do you actually find it uh, a feasible scenario that we will get recapitalization of some of these central banks via the local treasury departments? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the central bank. So, mm. you know, with the um, with the Fed, it's sort of automatic. So remittances go to zero and you see this sort of accumulated loss that appears on the Fed database or on the, you know, on the Fed's website. Um, and then they don't pay remittances until that thing goes back into positive territory again. That's actually quite a good mechanism because then you don't have to go to the treasury and say, you know, we need more money. Um, what worries me in Europe, um, you know, with the, with the Bank of England, it's it's the indemnity, so it's sort of automatic. So there's an understanding that that just happens automatically. What worries me is where there's a bit more discretion. And so, you know, I remember during the euro crisis, getting in, I was sending questions to the ECB about this because everyone was talking about, oh my God, the ECB is going to start losing money. Um, and are they going to be sort of monetizing Italian debt? And um, the ECB was sort of reluctant to give any kind of answer on this. <laughs> But, you know, after sort of a day of back and forth with the press officer at the ECB, um, the message seemed to be that, um, you know, if they started to make a loss, the ECB could ask finance ministers for a capital injection. 
but the finance ministers didn't have to provide the capital injection. <laughs> so it was a sort of legal, it was this sort of weird legal language. And I kept asking her about this and she kept sort of giving me this legal talk back again because obviously she's very <laughs> reluctant to, to do it. You know, it, it is, I, I think what they need to do is come up with some sort of mechanism, you know, that does this automatically because that's the least embarrassing way to do it. But you can't hide the optics of this. You know, even in the Fed way of doing this, we can go on to Fred, we can see, you know, this accumulating um, sort of debt that they're generating. And, you know, we can see that politicians are going to get pissed off about this because they're going to say, well, you're wasting public money. You know, why should technocrats be the ones to decide how this money gets spent? So so then you then you get into this sort of weird world of, um, well, can central banks start to tier reserves? And so that's sort of what the ECB has been trying to do. And that's effectively, you know, you get this fiscal hole and you pay for it by putting a tax on the banking sector because that's effectively <laughs> what it is. But I think the key takeaway from all of this is that in the end, you know, this is all sort of fiscal policy. And so, you know, it wasn't all that stuff about helicopter drops and monetization. It was all nonsense. You know, people just didn't really understand that all they were really doing was creating a sort of potential fiscal issue in the future. And they were just sort of conceding it on the central bank balance sheet. But the debt didn't just disappear. And so now we get the sort of fiscal consequences for that. And as far as I can see, you know, Andrew Bailey, who's never particularly good at communicating with the public, <laughs> he's, he's the only one that's ever admitted this out loud. And I remember I jumped on this at the time. And I was sending it to clients. and They were just sort of shrugging and going, well, I don't even know what this means. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have answered my question there, but you, you pretty much between the lines said you, you, you're more or less quite skeptic about the infl inflationary impact from of QE. And since you've... Um, since you were civil servant back when those first rounds of QE were made, can can you sort of unveil like to what extent were the long term uh, consequences of uh, of that those initiatives really considered at the time? I'm really curious about that. Um, I mean, what what are you um, describing as the long term consequences? Okay, so I mean, so, so for instance, uh, 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 the impact, the political impact of in, uh, of net negative equity, for instance. Like, oh, I don't um, think they really no. considered that at all. Um, the the worry at the time was that you would, you know, create sort of hyperinflation because <laughs> it was this yeah. new. You remember the word bazooka? You remember where yeah, people yeah. used to use that to describe QE? I mean, absolute nonsense. I mean, as far as I can yeah. see, QE did nothing. You know, it swapped one long dated government liability for another one that was concealed in the central bank's balance sheet. You know, it swapped bonds for yeah. bank reserves. Um, you know, maybe for financial markets, there was a sort of policy signal in that. So, you know, when central banks were doing QE, nobody thought they would raise interest rates. So your forward guidance became very, very credible. You did not need these massive sort of multi-year programs though, to deliver that. You could have delivered that with much smaller programs. Mm. Um, did it do anything for the real economy? Well, <laughs> you know, the irony here is that there are lots of studies showing that QE was really powerful, you know, really boosted inflation really boosted, real economic growth. And they're all written by central bankers. <laughs> and they're the only studies that show that. They have all so, the research capacities. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it, there's this sort of disconnect between uh, studies that are written by central bankers that show really powerful effects and studies that are written by everybody else that show almost no effect. And then the next level of that is that the central bankers who wrote those studies then got promoted. So there's this brilliant paper a few years ago looking at this and showing the, the sort of incentives that you had in the system. And I just think, you know, QE was mainly just one massive head fake. And if anything, it was sort of deflationary because it gave governments an excuse not to do more. So, you know, again, you know, go back to the Treasury. It's 2010. Uh, the government is about to embark on this massive austerity program in the UK. And the belief was that it was fine because the central bank could offset all of the effects with QE. And that was nonsense. And you just ended up with a really stupid policy mix because you ended up with austerity at a time when fiscal policy was very, very powerful. And you had very low interest rates at a time when monetary policy was completely ineffective. So net, you had a very deflationary policy mix. And hopefully that world is gone. And, you know, I, I sort of joke, but you know, I really hope QE never comes back, at least not in the form that it was in before, because 
you know, what does QE do? Well, it can be helpful for financial markets at a time of crisis. So it sort of backstops the system. That's very useful. Um, does it provide this sort of ongoing multi-year monetary boost? Well, not really. So, you know, what we're seeing, and I think central banks are beginning to realise this, and even, the you know, the Bank of Japan, I mean, it sort of put out this sort of muddled, muddled policy communication a couple of weeks ago. But the basic point was they don't want to use QE anymore for monetary policy because they don't need it or they don't want it. They want to use it just as a, as a financial policy device. So if something goes wrong, if yields are rising too quickly, if something is beginning to break, then use QE. And I think that's the message that we're getting from all these central bankers. You know, not QE, QE is the way forward, I think. <laughs> Dario, it brings me to your tweet of the week. And now I'm reading out aloud. It seems pretty clear at this point that the European central banks have already over-tightened. From here on, every month they spend in denial only compounds a series of the policy mistakes and risks unnecessary collateral damage. You need to explain that. I think I lean the same way, but how obvious is this to you that they've over-tightened already? Well, I mean, it's very obvious. I mean, you, you know, I always talk about this fake business cycle that we've been in. And the real recession risk was always that central banks would get whipsawed by this fake cycle. You know, there was this sort of, there was almost a bullwhip that was running through central banks and monetary policy, um, that they would be too aggressive because they would start to believe their own bullshit and think they were turning it, you know, the 1970s was happening because of monetary policy errors. That was the sort of big mistake 18 months ago. Um, that they would be much too aggressive and then they would deliver a recession. And if you look at the contrast between Europe and the US. I mean, it's stark. You know, you start off, you've got an economy that isn't booming on any metric. You know, you can't tell me there's been a European consumer boom over the last three years because I can't see it. So you have an economy that's fundamentally weaker. And then on top of that, you engineer a much bigger monetary tightening because of the structure of debt markets. So we have a lot more variable rate mortgages. We have a lot more short term variable rate corporate debt. And so if you look at effective interest rates, the, you know, the interest rates that businesses and households are paying on outstanding debts, they've gone up massively across Europe and they haven't gone up at all in the US. So you've generated a much bigger monetary squeeze on an economy that couldn't sustain it. So they've they sort of got chased into, they, they sort of chased the Fed higher to a level of interest rates that just isn't sustainable. And it seems pretty clear to me that, you know, Europe is sort of sliding into this recession. And European policymakers are just in denial about what's happening. And what I hope we're not going to get is another instalment of that ridiculous reverse currency war that we had last year. Because the lesson is that you're not going to defend your currency by letting your economy crash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're sort, of, they're sort of screwed whatever they do. Because, you know, if they, 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 they won't want to cut interest rates before the Fed because they'll be worried about their currency going down. But if they do nothing and they go into recession, which way is the currency going to go? It's not going to go up. <laughs> all, so it's completely futile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a completely futile exercise. So all we're waiting for now is the all clear from sort of very lagging European inflation data, which has been lagging the US throughout this entire sort of bullwhip cycle. And then finally, they get the all clear. And hopefully they cut interest rates quite quickly instead of just looking across to see what the Fed is doing, you know, copying the Fed's homework, which is the usual European approach. It is. The big question here is whether the Federal Reserve will actually dare to move in an easier direction next year. And that's my final question uh, of the show for you, Dario. <laughs> How do you view the feedback loop introduced by Jay Powell at the last press conference? It seemed like he basically passed the keys to the uh, monetary policy, to financial conditions in broader terms, uh, measured by equity markets and uh, and treasury markets. So is the Fed Reserve even in control of the path ahead here? This is the sort of financial conditions boom loop. You know, you've mm -hmm. heard about the doom loop, or this is the sort of other one where <laughs> the market starts to anticipate, you know, rate cuts, the Fed tilts hawkish, then you get the other way, you get this sort of sort of oscillation in financial conditions. I think that was always going to happen. So even if you totally buy into the higher for longer, You know, we were not going to be in a situation where the Fed said, right, interest rates are on hold for the next 18 months and everyone just stopped looking at the Fed and stopped thinking about monetary policy. We're always going to get this sort of speculation about what happens next. And you're going to get this, this sort of 
automatic, um, you know, pivoting in financial conditions and then hawkishness, dovishness. Um, I think that's that's mainly noise. And I think you, you have to look beyond that. And, you know, that's going to continue. It's going to be very frustrating, but that's going to continue until we actually get some certainty about what's happening. So that question that, you know, we had at the start of this year, which was, you know, is this going to be a hard landing, a no landing or a soft landing? Until that question is actually resolved and we get sort of finality there, um, then we're just going to be in that sort of mini loop in financial conditions. Once it gets resolved, then we'll get a sort of major breakout one way or the other. Mm. My guess is that for the Fed, this all comes down to the labour market. You know, if, if the labour market genuinely starts to crack, and I, I'm not defining that by the SARM rule, because I don't think that's the right rule at the moment. <laughs> I'm defining it by the Perkins rule, which is this <laughs> rule that I've tried to push on Twitter and no one's remotely interested in. <laughs> but it's, it's the Perkins rule, which is much simpler. You know, you don't have to do sort of three-month moving averages and compare it to some other three-month moving average. It's one negative payroll, right? If we get one negative payroll number and it's not explained by strikes or bad weather, that is a pretty clear sign that the economy is going into a recession. That is when the Fed will panic and start pivoting hard. Mm-hmm. Very simple rule. You know, you don't have to yeah. do any sort of advanced. <laughs> it's not going to be on Fred, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and you're not going to win the Nobel Prize for that one, Harry. Right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> come <simple> on. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love simplicity. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. Isn't that yeah. an old saying in English? <laughs> <laughs> but Dario, if that if that really kicks in, how do you think financial markets will take it? I mean, w- once they really open for for the liquidity and yeah. uh, perhaps the expected uh, recession or the you know the negative payroll is not exactly dire, is it possible that we get the whole circle, circus back in town in 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 risk assets and whatnot? Yeah, I mean that's what yeah. normally happens. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the annoying thing about the Perkins rule is that I invented it before the Sarm rule, but I didn't. I didn't call it the Perkins rule or make it popular on Twitter. Um, what happens it. here? So I'll tell you what typically happens, right? So you get sort of two um, sort of dynamics. The first one is that you get a recession that starts in the financial sector. So there is some massive financial imbalance, subprime, or some you know some crazy thing that some yeah. hedge fund's been doing. And then that triggers a recession, right? There's, there's, you can't, you know, you just sort of wait for that to happen and you can't hide, you know, it's, it's not like you can position yourself carefully for that. Um, the other sort of recession is one that begins in the economy. And that starts when employment starts to turn negative because, you know, I remember being on your show before and talking about what a recessionary process actually is. You know, it's employment starts to go down, confidence plunges, spending plunges, then you get more rounds of redundancies. That is the recessionary dynamic. Now, typically, uh, you you see that when employment starts to contract. So you know that you're entering a recession because it hardly ever happens outside of recessions. And then the market reaction immediately is, well, we know that the Fed knows that this is really important. So surely the Fed is going to ease. And so then you get this sort of view that the Fed is going to save the world. Typically, yields go up. And the equity market rebounds, which seems bizarre, right? But then it's a question of, is that Fed response going to be forthcoming? And is it sufficient? So if you're getting genuine reflexivity in the economy and a genuinely recessionary dynamic, the Fed cuts are not going to be enough immediately. Or the Fed could be too slow, or it could be in denial and just focusing on inflation being above 3%, which would be sort of bizarre in that environment. But you could get that. So that so I say, you know, and this is what I said before on the show, is that you don't need to be able to forecast a recession. You just need to know a recession when you see one. A bit like pornography, you know it when you see it. And the Perkins rule is your guide. I'm going to keep pushing the Perkins rule. It's never going to take off, but I'm going to keep pushing it. That will tell you as an investor that a recession has started, and that is your opportunity to get out of risk assets because the market will give you that opportunity to get out because it always has this blind faith in central bankers. But I think that's the point at which you need to start worrying as an investor. And you don't need to forecast any of this. You know, you just need to know it when you see it. I think that's a great wrap up of this discussion yeah. on central banks, insolvency and the path ahead for the <laughs> European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve. Dario Perkins, MD of Global Macro at CS Lombard. Thank you for being with us.
founder of the Perkins rule. <laughs> Back from the interview with the geezer, Terry <laughs> Perkins, I love how he combines um, <laughs> academic words with words like bollocks, <laughs> bullshit. And, yeah. and you got to love it. If you yeah, love it. <laughs> you, you can tell he's been at the pub. In there. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I simply just love Dario. He's, he's a tremendous guy. Yeah. Uh, and um, one of the best at Central Bank watching out there. Uh, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting also to hear his view on on European central banks amidst this. Um, mm. it, it basically rhymes with our view that European duration is is a pretty decent buy here. We've, I think we're up like 5% since centering. Uh, we, like we basically that. caught the bottom here. Yeah. Um, Bit of luck as well, but I think sure. So, sure the fundamentals behind the trade are absolutely solid. Yeah. I mean, that, it, 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 it's not one of those that keeps me up at night, let me put it that way. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, um, I think adding to this, Emil, mm. we've been uh, relatively vocal recently that we find um, a couple of the major FX pairs in Asia um, out of whack mm. with fundamentals. Mm. And if we're right, uh, we also had that discussion with Dario, obviously, that the feedback loop would allow the Federal Reserve to hike in December. Mm. Or at least there's a pretty decent risk. It's definitely not a non-zero probability. No. Um, then, of course, the dollar could gain some yeah. sort of short-term tailwind from, from that mm. interest rate story. Yeah. On the other hand of the equation, in Asian terms, we have the Bank of Japan not really willing to commit to moving out of negative territory on the policy rate. Mm. We have uh, China being basically stuck at the zero bound, more or less, um, yeah. in practical terms as well, on the policy rate. So threats are extreme. Yeah. And even the IMF <laughs> have noticed <laughs> that. Um, yeah. They finished their uh, study trip to to China this week with a letter that they published on the website. And one of the main takeaways was that, well, spreads are too wide to keep the Wang trading here at 7.30 versus the dollar. Yeah, uh, That was essentially one of the main conclusions. Yeah. And... Well, it's not often a good idea to be on in the same boat as the IMF when you're trading. Uh, <laughs> I actually think it's it's quite telling for the sort of pending weakness yeah. in the in the in the Wang here. So, Emil, you're obviously following China on our behalf. What, yeah. uh, what's your takeaways from from most recent price action here and 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 the policy decisions taken in China? So nothing is really surprising here. And you know, if 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 the IMF has something figured out, everyone basically is in the know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. That's the Emil rule then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and I think basically all quant uh, funds and what have you, they they are basically long dollar CNI, CNI here. Mm. They can uh, short them in practically. Um, and I think that what we've seen in China. I mean, if you if you look at the gap between the fixing and the actual um, and the actual exchange rate, mm. I think it's quite it's quite striking that they have actually let it go this far, mm. and I think that's that's sort of a it reveals their preferences, because I mean, if if they really wanted to, uh, China has plenty of reserves to just h smash down the exchange rate and and put it in line with the fixing, but they don't choose to. Mm. And the reason why is that it's the lesser evil, so to speak. It's more palatable to them to let the currency fly, but they want to do it in a controlled manner. Mm. And that's why if if you if you catch the right bottom of of entering that that uh, the, the, the the dollar versus the the wang here, um, I think you have a pretty safe trade, and uh, that's why we have re-entered basically. Mm. They might not be dealing with the real estate issues in the best way in China, but they know how to handle drug issues. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the reason why I say this yeah. is we, we have a hilarious um, soundbite from a press anyway. conference held by, yeah. by Donald Trump on drug policies in China. They fixed it. And here's the simple reason why. Donald Trump. Full of this stuff. And in China, they have a very, very tough penalty for drugs. It's called the death penalty. And I said to President Xi, you don't have much of a drug problem. Do you have a drug problem? No. No drug problem. I said, so you have 1.4 billion people, and you don't have a drug problem. That's right. No drug problem. I said, what do you attribute that to? Death penalty. <laughs> they don't have trials that last 19 years. At the end of a, the judge dies, everybody dies. The only one living is the one that did the, the damage. You know, they have what's called a quick trial. It goes quick.
<laughs> um, obviously, a, a, a hilarious press conference, this one. Um, what I wanted to say here, Emil, um, that was, we were talking yeah. U.S.-Chinese relations, uh, yeah. is that we received the quarterly numbers on the foreign direct investment flows into China over the past week. Mm. Uh, so we know, now have the numbers for Q3. And for the first time in the history of the time series, Inwards FDI was negative in Q3. Mm. That's a bit of a eye-opening shock to me because obviously the trend has been, yeah, yeah. from a momentum perspective, negative. But now we're in negative territory for inwards FDI. So meaning that, well, <laughs> yeah. money is being pulled out. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, it, it just speaks to the level of 3D chess that the Chinese bureaucracy is basically engaging themselves in, right? So you have capital flight in practice. That's mm. basically what negative FDI is sort of uh, f- f- telling you here. Mm. You have uh, <laughs> the world's greatest asset bubble deflating mm. and you have basically no, uh, like, you know, th- there's no history who could really help you uh, managing that, right? Yep. And uh, thirdly, you have the, the, the push on, on the exchange rate, right? And basically, we've sold the, did you see the numbers this morning from... Uh, uh, the CPI and PPI numbers uh, basically we're back to uh, deflation as well yeah, yeah. in CPI terms uh, if PPI was already negative but so so I mean everything is just screaming at you weaker one so so, he, so here's one thing to take note of um, when we started hitting the cap of 730 in practical terms mm. it was very driven by uh, an oil price rally um, yeah, and obviously with the oil rallying, both um, in dollar terms, in one terms, and even also rallying uh, in <laughs> Russian benchmark terms. Yeah, um, which is not uh, no, no. Uh, uh, neglectable here uh, oh, from from uh, from a Ru- Russian Chinese perspective here because they trade a lot with each other, right? Sure. Then, obviously, the timing of allowing the uh, Wang to weaken further was not super attractive given that China is still an importer of oil, right? Yeah. Um, and now that we've seen a, quite a turnaround on the oil case, I think the appetite is growing in China to allow the uh, the weakness in the currency here because then you have sort of mitigating effects if the oil price is a bit lower. Right? Yeah, th- there's that that's that part. And also, if you if you look at the import figures, they, 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 they surprised a bit to the upside here in the lead up. And I think that was because they were sort of planning to restock a bit mm. before they might engage in some sort of, you know, more manufacturing activity. That's what they want, but they, they have a hard time really getting getting it kicked uh, down the road there. Um, and on the other hand, they're trying to restrain uh, the construction sector from starting new <laughs> useless initiatives. So, um, um, you know, uh, I think I think uh, the. They don't have that import pressure in, in broader terms. That's basically my point here. And the oil story is obviously one component to it, no doubt. Yeah. So. Emil, I'm going to throw you out of the studio oh. before the CCP <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starts yeah. monitoring our little <laughs> podcast here. And there's a reason why, because um, in five seconds, I'm joined by our new crypto analyst, Mass Eberhardt, here in the studio. And uh, Mass is, first of all, an extremely talented guy, uh, mm-hmm. born and raised professionally in um, in digital assets, um, former crypto analyst at Saxo Bank, but also the former founder of one of the biggest exchanges for cryptocurrency in Denmark. Um, so already sold that. Um, so uh, Mass joins me now here in uh, in the studio, and I wanted to give you a, just a very brief flavor of what we're launching here with our coverage of uh, digital assets. Mass, uh, it's great to see you here in the studio. Thank you. Mass, um, we've actually seen a pretty decent move in um, in Bitcoin, say, over the past month or so. Uh, and it's quite interesting that it happens amidst all of the turmoil in uh, risk assets elsewhere. So what do you make of it? Is it uh, driven by the Bitcoin having next year or is it driven by Chinese flows? What's, what's your takeaway here? No, it's, it's mainly driven by, by two factors. One of them, of course, the halving. The halving uh, is expected for, for April next year. And we know that this, this has happened uh, three times before. And about one and a half years uh, after the halving each time, Bitcoin has made a new all-time high. And of course, we cannot say with any guarantees that this is going to happen now. But it is a factor that is, that is playing a role now. And also another one, which is probably the biggest factor actually, the uh, having. Uh, 
made uh, Bitcoin go higher for the past months or so is the, the, the upcoming, in, in my eyes, the upcoming uh, Bitcoin ETF mm. in the US. So uh, previously, uh, the SEC, they approved uh, what we call a, a Bitcoin uh, futures ETF that was approved uh, about two years ago. But they haven't, they have so far denied all of the uh, the Bitcoin spot ETFs mm. uh, because they think that the, the market is is prone to be uh, manipulated. But what we know now is that the BlackRock just before the summer, they just suddenly filed for a Bitcoin spot <laughs> ETF. And I think it is because they know something. I think the SEC probably went to them and said, hey, if you try to file for a, a Bitcoin spot ETF, then we will probably approve it. Mm. Um, and we know that that this has also played a huge role uh, for gold. The mm. first spot uh, gold ETF was approved in uh, about 20 years ago, and it played a huge role just for for institutionals to to gain a- access mm. to to gold in an easy manner, uh, but also for retail because then you don't have to to store the gold uh, mm. under your pillow at home, uh, but instead you can just use it. With, uh, use uh, an ETF, which is very cost-effective and mm. easy to to trade and so on. Mm. Master, we know anything about a potential timing of this spot ETF. What are the, sort of the <laughs> current stories on that uh, on that call? I think actually the, the deadline for the SEC, like the, the pretty soft deadline, is January 10th. Okay. Uh, at least for, for the BlackRock uh, ETF. Uh, so I think probably what they will do is that they will... Uh, probably approve all of the ETFs at the same time if mm. they they think they are they are good enough to be approved, uh, because they don't want uh, BlackRock to to run away with all the all the funds. Yep. Uh, but I'm I'm very confident that that we will see it uh, start trading in in the next couple of months. Yep. If you're interested in our research offering on digital assets then we have an exclusive offer uh, for you listening to the podcast. Um, you can use the coupon code CRYPTO20 to gain 20% off your first three payments on this new digital asset research product. Mass, it's great to have you on board. Uh, we look forward to also hosting you here now and then in the Macro Sunday podcast. And then hopefully uh, a lot of people out there will uh, will try out your new product. Thank you, yes. <laughs> and um, to those of you listening out there, thank you very much for um, for tuning into the Macro Sunday podcast once again. Remember that we are out each and every Sunday with 100% independent takes on everything macro, now also everything crypto related, yes. uh, and everything related to cross asset trading. So go to standardresearch.com if you're curious um, for more. And uh, other than that, I'll see you again next week. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. <laughs>